Hello and welcome to the Exact Pro channel. My name is Kirill, I am a QA analyst at Exact Pro. At Exact Pro, we build software to test software. Check out our website, exactpro.com, if you want to learn more about us. If you're new to our channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to make sure you see all the new videos. Today we will talk about a Hollywood comedy entitled The Pentagon Wars. To illustrate some of the issues we, as a software testing company, face quite often. The Pentagon Wars movie doesn't focus on software testing per se. It depicts the real-life path of the Bradley fighting vehicle, from the idea phase to the prototype. The phases it went through, however, are similar to the stages of the software development lifecycle. In fact, the film brilliantly illustrates the concept of fake testing and the importance of independent testing. Without further ado, let's meet the main characters. Major General Partridge is in charge of the Bradley Fighting Vehicle project, which has been trying to reach the production stage for 17 years. Congress appoints an outsider, U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel James Burton, to observe the testing of several new weapons currently in development. His primary objective is to sort out the mess that the Bradley project has become. Are you looking for something, sir? Just reading the fine print, Sergeant. Just reading the fine print. Burton quickly discovers that the creators of the Bradley have all been after promotions rather than eager to supply the army with a powerful, reliable machine. From the mountains of paper documenting years of the Bradley's development history, Burton discovers that over the years the vehicle has been rendered useless and extremely dangerous for the crew inside it. It was practically a death trap. The question is, how did they get to that? From this. All Burton's attempts at testing the Bradley under combat conditions are made impossible by Partridge and his two subordinates, Colin Bock and Major Sayers. Please, some, some spitball from Romania! It was my understanding that only Soviet arms would be used in these tests. Well, yes. And Romania is one of the Soviet blocs. But at some point, Burton is contacted by Brigadier General Robert L. Smith, the officer previously in charge of the project. Smith helps him, but himself stays in the shadows to protect his own career. I've been reading memos on the Bradley going back to 1968, with your handwritten notes in the margin or initialed by you. This handwriting? We should not be seen talking. Burton has to overcome a lot of obstacles, but at the end, the Bradley gets significantly improved, with all the flaws spotted during the testing phase fixed. The final product is actually a decent war machine. Now, let's illustrate how the above story relates to software testing. In the opening scene, we see Major General Partridge answering questions at the congressional hearing, attempting to explain the multiple failures revealed in the years of him designing the Bradley and other weapons for the US Army. The interrogation scene from the very beginning sheds some light on the concept of testability. It also shows us how easily it can be turned upside down by a fake testing expert. Software testability is the degree to which a software system or a unit under test supports its own testing. If applied correctly, it can be very helpful to testers and, in the long run, ensure better software quality. But when it's misunderstood and applied the way General Partridge did it, it achieves just the opposite. To ensure that a heat-seeking infrared missile successfully hits the target, they covered the BFV with electric hot plates. At first glance, it may seem that this was done to ensure better testability. But the problem was that, in this case, the system under test wasn't the tank, but the missile. In previous tests, it repeatedly failed to see the tank using its own heat radiation. So the task was simplified to fake success. A fake testability situation may easily occur in a large infrastructure, where end-to-end -end testing requirements demand that everything should be covered. In another scene, a construction crane was used to drop a bomb hoisted on its rope directly onto the tank. Another hard-to-fail test. Obviously, this test wasn't created to achieve higher bomb quality, but to fake the success of the team in charge. 
Madam Chairwoman at the congressional hearing sarcastically remarks that all this test proves is that they have an effective weapon as long as the enemy allows them to build a two-story crane directly above their tanks. It may seem like an exaggeration, but similar things often happen in the software testing world. Here we can see a classical picture explaining the concept of true testability. The point is to put a target on the whole system and not be satisfied with revealing the obvious defects. It's essential for any large-scale infrastructure. In the example with the missile and the hot plates, the test would make sense if the purpose were to test the armor of the tank and its ability to withstand the missile impact. Then simplifying the task for the missile would definitely help. At some point of its development, the Bradley is described as a troop transport that can't carry troops, a reconnaissance vehicle that's too conspicuous to do reconnaissance, and a quasi-tank that has less armor than a snowblower, but has enough ammo to take out half of DC. How exactly did it get to that from being initially intended simply as troop transport? Many testers and business analysts have been victims to a similar process while delivering software. We are talking about feature creep. In this movie, we see a vivid example of the feature request snowballing and getting out of control. In other words, it was designed to be a big taxi cab, drive guys to the battlefield and go back home. Mm -hmm. But how did it end up with a turret on top? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is all well and good, Colonel Smith, but... Something wrong, General? Well, with this gorilla in production, I don't suppose there's going to be anything left in the budget for my scout. Doubt it, Bob. You don't need scouts. You have radar, air recon, satellite... Originally designed as a troop carrier, the Bradley was supposed to play just one role and play it well. That was to deliver 11 men to the battlefield swiftly and safely. But this wasn't enough for the generals who found an easy way to fulfill all their ambitions in this one project including selling the BFV outside the US. To please their egos and attract the buyers, they requested to adjust the design to also make the Bradley a scout vehicle. They requested increased opticals, port holes on the side for increased firearms, a turret, and so on. Once the feature creep began, it couldn't stop. To protect the vehicle from possible attacks, now that it resembled a tank more and more with every iteration, they requested more ammunition which required to sacrifice the room for troops. The final version could only carry six men instead of the originally planned 11. At the same time, to make the vehicle fast enough for reconnaissance, the armor was made from aluminum instead of steel, so the BFV became incapable of taking heavy enemy fire. That's one hell of a cannon. That's a problem. Why? You go out in a battlefield with this pecker sticking out of your turret, and the enemy's gonna unload on you with all they got. Might as well paint a big red bullseye on the side. But it's a troop carrier, not a tank. Do you want me to put a sign on it in 50 languages? I'm a troop carrier, not a tank. Please don't shoot at me. This scene delivers a perfect illustration of why rationale, statements, and correct requirements are absolutely vital. Feature creep sometimes known as requirements creep or scope creep, is a tendency for product or project requirements to increase during development beyond the ones originally planned. Feature creep may be driven by a client's growing wish list or by developers themselves as they see opportunity for improving the product. It's especially common with iterative, agile-like software development. You think you could make this thing amphibious? You know, get the troops across a river? No. Uh, no, sir. No. No, 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 no. Carrier slash scout slash tank. Couple more months, I bet they can get this thing to fly. What's this in the margin? However, the practice of piling up requirements without any justification makes engineers vulnerable. In fact, all quality assurance should always begin with careful business analysis. Having said that, we are not implying that adding new features to a product is a bad thing. It's what Agile is all about. But at every iteration, we have to make sure that the new features don't break the existing and still important functionality of the system we are trying to improve. This means that testing teams need a comprehensive regression library. For a complex technology system, the sophistication of the test library 
and the test harness should measure up to the complexity of the platform under test. We strongly recommend to assign dedicated test harness development teams for large-scale platform implementations. This is to avoid product teams getting carried away with adding multiple new features. Otherwise, the fact that their product no longer works may be discovered too late. The goal of true testing is to find defects in the product so they could be fixed. The goal of fake testing is to imitate the testing process while making sure that the defects remain well hidden and the product can be accepted as is without the necessary corrections. On paper, the Bradley was shot at and passed with flying colors. Its defensive capabilities were verified. But in practice, it was vulnerable and even easily flammable. Stinger missiles, 50 cal tracers, 7.62 tracers, 25 millimeter rounds. What's this? That's what was used on the Bradley, sir. This writing, it's Romanian, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. The field testers intentionally used extremely weak Romanian grenade launchers instead of the much more powerful Soviet ones. And as a result, the Bradley emerged virtually unscathed. An attack like that couldn't even seriously affect an armory door, as Burton himself demonstrated. Why is that? Well, this is very serious. It is. Yes, you've destroyed a door. Same answer. Fake testing. The main purpose of the test was to conceal the truth to be allowed to launch the Bradley into production. This was achieved by using the tools that wouldn't harm the object under test. The official explanation of such testing tactics was we are interested in conducting ballistic tests using all sorts of ammunition of varying diameters to determine the exact threshold of the Bradley's tolerance. In the software testing business, similar statements are often made to imitate a scientific approach to the process. This approach can be valid under certain circumstances, and if the testers actually reach that threshold and document it. Otherwise, it creates an illusion that the system is strong enough to withstand the expected kind of load. On all our projects, we recommend not to rely on predefined KPIs, but identify the ammo that will eventually crush the software. We often encounter load injectors supplied by the vendors alongside their systems to do the benchmarking. In most cases, these injectors are designed to minimize harm and to work seamlessly with the system under test. It's actually the opposite of what's required from a software testing tool. To be efficient, software testing tools should leave a large hole in the armor, and that was the approach that Burton preferred. In the subsequent tests, he used a much stronger grenade launcher, and the Bradley got a large hole in its armor. What's more important is that we need to question everything, including our own test tools, to make sure they are up to the task. When Burton confronts Major General Partridge with a concern that Bradley doesn't suit its end users' needs very well, he meets understandable resistance. Major General Partridge tries to distract him with loads of paperwork, but Burton surprises him by announcing that he has already read all the papers. The movie makes a strong case for how one can easily get lost in papers and that countless papers may in fact fail to provide accurate requirements and test analysis. When creating the requirements document, it's important to think about whether the component will interface with third-party supplier systems. It's critical for engineers to rigorously analyze the needs of all potential stakeholders who will interact with the system, something that the military officials in the film have clearly failed to do. When we test software, one of the fundamental skills is to be able to make sense of the original requirements, no matter how obscure they might be, and to process high volumes of such written information. It's even more important to recheck everything, even if the documentation claims that something has already been tested. Our goal is to make sure that nothing was missed or maybe intentionally concealed during previous testing activities, as it was done with the Bradley. 
For testing purposes, fuel was replaced with water and the ammunition filled with sand to make sure that the tank doesn't explode. This technique helped Partridge use the same tank in several tests. He claimed it was a forced measure because he wasn't given more machines for testing. But the tests carried out under such condition did nothing to show how the machine would behave in a real battle. The point of testing is to see how the product, be it a tank or a piece of software, is going to behave in real life, which means that the test environment should resemble the setting that the production is going to encounter in the hands of real-life users. We mentioned that the goal of true testing is to highlight the defects, not conceal them. Any attempt to save the product during the testing phase from the possible dangers of real-life conditions results in fake testing. The data gained during such testing is basically useless. Fake test conditions produce fake test results. Similarly, the results were faked by Major General Partridge in the subsequent tests involving ship and clothed dummies. To reduce the weight of the tank, a part of the plating was made out of a thin layer of aluminum. When it's heat, the metal evaporates and gives off a poisonous gas. Burton suspects foul play. And to test his hypothesis, he decides to put a ship into the tank. He was told that it would take months to prepare the right ship in advance, since all ships are different, and testing is a scientific experiment that should be conducted in controlled environments. Not long at all. Six, eight months tops. Then, then we can go to tender on the research data. But then we'll require another eight months to evaluate the data, after which we can move in the prototype room and evaluate it. You can refer to this example when applying development methodologies like BDD that require all scenarios to be ready in advance. It's highly likely that if one knows the testing scenarios ahead of time, they are no longer objective as a system developer. The code writing will be inevitably affected by the known test scenarios and the expected results. Lieutenant Colonel Burton finally found a way out by buying a small flock of sheep from a farmer. As expected, the sheep died during the test. Unfortunately, this evidence was stolen from him by Partridge's accomplices while he was rushing a soldier to the medical unit after he also inhaled the poisonous gas that killed the ship. What does it tell us, the software testing professionals? While conducting your independent testing, make sure to preserve your test results and keep your backups in a safe place. Don't trust anyone with important evidence. Without the benefit of that forethought, Burton ordered a field test to determine how flammable the Bradley might be in case of enemy fire. He put fully clothed mannequins in the Bradley to see if the clothes would be burned. But knowing that the test is likely to lead to an explosion, test officials stripped the dummies and placed their clothes in a fireproof container. Later Burton discovered the charred remains of one of the dummies being hastily evacuated from the field yet another illustration of fake test conditions leading to fake test results. In the end, Burton finally managed to organize one, just one real test. The machine, when placed under real combat conditions, exploded. The turret got detached by the explosion and flew up in the air. As a result of independent testing properly done, the Bradley underwent another extensive redesign. More time and money was spent. All the bugs got fixed, and later, during the Gulf War, this redesign saved countless lives of US soldiers. But there is always a but. Though testing apparently saved a lot of lives, those credited for the project were not those in charge of testing. Promotions and other lucrative rewards went to Partridge and his allies, whereas Burton was forced to leave the army. Similarly, testing can save a system. You may be a hero and make the world a better place, but you mustn't expect to be thanked. There is a chance that the independent testing provider will never be asked by the same client to do this sort of job again. And that's part of the game. After all, our goal is to save systems, not to earn admiration. People who are involved in independent testing are aware of it and accept it as part of their job. The same way as Lt. Col. Burton sacrificed his personal career for the things that to him looked more important.
This is all for today. Thanks so much for staying with us. If you found this information useful, feel free to share this video and give us a thumbs up. You can also browse the Exact Pro channel for more useful insights and subscribe to stay on top of the new videos. See you soon!